Hi, welcome to Systems Medicine, Lecture 2. <laughs> and let's start by taking a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> uh, you recall we do in order to enter the relaxed state, better listening, better learning. And we already completed two things on our list. And how many of you are here for the first time, missed last lecture? It's okay, I'm gonna do a review. Yeah, don't worry about it. And, and let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. We have our, our norm, people coming in late, we welcome you, it's fine. And the um, last lecture, we talked about the glucose insulin feedback loop, which is like a hydrogen atom of physiological circuits. And this is the beginning of setting the frame for a three lecture module, which is saying, which we'll discuss how the body can keep a good set point of something important like blood sugar, how, uh, in order to do this, tissues need to have some essential kind of feedbacks in order to keep their size right, to keep the level correct. And we'll see how this essential kind of feedback has essential fragility. You can't avoid, because we're talking about bi biology. And that leads to fragility to diseases. And so in this lecture, we'll talk about the global epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Try to explain it in terms of fundamental principles. I mean, why is this disease? And then next lecture, we'll ex try to explain type 1 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is about 10% of the world population. Type 1 diabetes is about 1%. So these are huge diseases. That's our goal. Nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Welcome. And uh, so that's, yes, I built the basic uh, understanding of the glucose insulin feedback loop and some equations. So I want to review that. Uh, in our blood, blood glucose is kept to a very tight range, around 5 millimolar concentration, plus minus 1 between healthy people. If you drink some the clinical test, you drink 75 grams of glucose. If after two hours your glucose is above 11 millimolar, it's diagnosed with diabetes. Too high glucose causes long-term damage to blood vessels, nerves, etc. Type 2 diabetes. Too low glucose, <coughs> cells needed for energy, the brain, other cells. If you don't have energy, you can faint. Cells start eating fat, which makes the blood more acidic. You can die from acidic blood, ketoacidosis. So too low is lethal, too high has long-term negative effects. The body keeps glucose a very tight range, around 5 millimolar. Not only, a nice deep sigh of relief. Not only is the glucose steady state kept to tight range, the entire dynamics after you drink 75 grams of glucose is very stereotyped between people. It goes up to about twice and then goes down to baseline within two hours. That's why if you are above 11 after two hours, it means something wrong with your feedback loop. Um, and um, uh, we drew the circuit and we started to write down some differential equations in order to um, both show that the basic, so, you know, in biology textbooks you see this, this is a blood vessel, this is a cell, this is a glucose transporter, glucose goes in, it does, the transporter isn't there all the time, it's only there when insulin receptor on the cell surface binds insulin, these green circuits. Where does the insulin come from? It comes from the pancreas, the pancreas is a, is a thin gland about the size of a dollar bill behind our stomach and it has, most of it is exocrine for making bile, but it has these little eyelets which have beta cells, the beta cells are glucose sensors that secrete insulin, so the more glucose, the more insulin secreted, therefore the more glucose goes out of the blood, and that's a negative feedback loop. And that's what's called a prose word explanation, nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Welcome, you can sit over there, no problem. Um, let, and then we wrote equations to be able to ask another level of questions. So <coughs> I'm going to draw the circuit again, we have meal, makes glucose, this is blood glucose. These are the beta cells, and they secrete insulin. Insulin reduces blood glucose, and glucose enhances the secretion of uh, insulin from the beta cells. Insulin, blood, glucose. So that's our feedback loop, the glucose-insulin feedback loop. Time scale, as I said, on the order of an hour. That's the removal rate of insulin. Nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> so nice that you're here. <laughs> There's one more chair. 
one more side of really <laughs> left in our, and, and we wrote down the equations. So remember, it's worth worth uh, worth worth our while to have equations in biology. So we have our uh, rate of change of glucose. This rate of change of glucose, and it goes in from the meal, and also from a basal production of glucose. The liver has the uh, stores that it can always release glucose. So when we're not eating, when we're asleep, for example, it's it's the liver that makes glucose for our brain. Yeah. So that's uh, so that's in here too. And then we have the removal of glucose. So this is production. And removal is always glucose times some rate constant, which is the probability per unit time for a glucose molecule to be removed. That's always, all removal terms are like that. Because the more glucose we have, the more is removed per unit time, because it's a removal rate per molecule. And that arises with insulin. So this is the removal rate. And this number here is called insulin sensitivity. Activity. A very important parameter, how much each unit of insulin in the blood is effective in removing glucose. And you can measure that, for example, by injecting insulin and seeing how, what happens to glucose. It's a number that varies between people widely. So we said that different things affect insulin sensitivity. For example, because it sets the location of glucose to different tissues, if you exercise, uh, muscles need glucose. So insulin sensitivity goes up and more blood glucose is goes to the muscle. On the other hand, if you have an, an inflammation, the immune system which is in the blood needs that glucose. So S goes down and more glucose stays in the blood. And so inflammation, infection makes sensitivity go down. That's called insulin resistance. Also obesity causes insulin resistance partly because it causes inflammation and partly because of the fatty acid effects. And pregnancy makes insulin resistance. Insulin is less effective in removing glucose from the blood. More blood goes to the fetus. In fact, hormones in the placenta, mom's placenta affect mom's insulin resistance to favor the fetus. Yeah. And so we talked about these different factors. So that varies maybe a factor of 10 between everyone here in the room. But we all have 5 millimolar glucose, despite the fact that each unit of insulin works so differently between us. This one. Yeah. So that's a, and then we talked about insulin secretion. So this is the rate of change of blood insulin. So it's, it's made by beta cells. This is the maximal secretion rate by, per beta cell. And then there's some control function where the more glucose, the more secretion. That's this control function here. So we can say that this is f of g here. This is s. Here we have q. All these parameters are on this graph. And insulin also is removed. So like every removal term in biology, it's insulin times rate per molecule <coughs> of insulin to be removed, gamma, which gives you a half-life of about 30 minutes, this rate function. Right, we wrote these equations. We asked, can they explain what's the, you know, biological experiments and measurements? And indeed they can. In fact, they were developed by people like Richard Bergman in the 70s based on very elaborate experiments where you take people and you give them infusions of glucose and insulin and measure glucose and insulin with high resolution and so you can perturb the system and build a minimal model out of many models that describes this well. And this is, this is a simplified version. The minimal model has an extra, some extra details but not important for us. And it's also used to take biological measurements and try to estimate parameters like S and Q. So it's, it's very useful clinically to have this model and also conceptually. So if you try to simulate this model, eh, you see the response to, let's say, drinking 75 grams of glucose, the glucose tolerance test. Of course, you don't need to write down, because as you know, we're videoing this. So thanks again for videoing, all of you watching the video. Uh, and so if this glucose input is like a, a pulse of M, this is glucose going in, source of glucose going in. And if I draw a glucose now, as a function of time, so this is time zero, this is time one hour, this is time two hours. I start from my five millimolar, my basal level. And now glucose goes up. Why does it go up? 
because M has gone up. So the rate of change of glucose is higher, it goes up. But then what happens is that insulin, which has also its basal insulin level that you can measure, also goes up. And when insulin goes up, glucose goes down. And glucose goes down, it goes back to steady state, and insulin goes down. And that's what happens when you put these equations on the computer, like you'll do in the exercise sheet number one, which we'll hand in next, we'll give you next week. There'll be one exercise every two weeks, as you remember. You'll be able to solve these equations, verify for yourself, and it works. It's fantastic. But there's one place where it doesn't work, and that is the question of why is it that people with insulin resistance also have usually normal glucose. More, most people with obesity that have tenfold higher insulin resistance, tenfold lower S, have normal glucose, normal glucose dynamics. So this here is real people with insulin resistance. I mean healthy people without diabetes but with insulin resistance. But the model If we put in, let's say some, here S equals 1. If I make S equals 0 0.1, so if I get, in the model, if I lower S by tenfold, the baseline rises to 10, and the response time also rises. This is the model. So there's something wrong here, because like every model, it's, just, it's sensitive to parameters. It changes the rate parameter by a factor of 10. Everything's going to change. But in the body, it doesn't change, unless you have diabetes. Yeah? So we need to understand that. Um, I think I'm done with the, rev with the review, just want to check. Yeah, I am done with the review. So just in order to see if we understand we're on the same page, I want to ask you to pair up the person sitting next to you, spend a couple minutes asking each other if there's any question, explaining to each other, just to make sure. So please enjoy that. Or it could be behind you. Can you say something like that? I'll leave a any thoughts compared? You say Until there's a question. So, who's going to ask a question now about the review? Yeah. So, glucose is universal for real people. Yeah. Insulin, insulin could also be universal for real people? The insulin curve. Yeah. yeah. So, the question is what happens to insulin with people with insulin resistance? Insulin for people with insulin resistance is much higher. Real people with insulin resistance. So, that means that people, how can people? pull off this having each insulin unit work less well and still have five millimolar, they make more insulin. But they have to balance it exactly. Yeah, more questions. Yeah. What is the relation between alpha and gamma? Alpha and gamma. So this is gamma. And what is alpha? S -I. This thing. Yeah. What is the relationship between the rate of glucose removal and the lifetime of glucose? Yes. Of insulin. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not aware of a relation. Do, do you have a reason why you ask this? Because it's like a, the removal of glucose is like a, it depends on insulin, and the fact in this case somehow, like in certain people who have higher insulin, but they don't have removal of glucose. 
Okay. So as far as I know, the question is, uh, as far as I know, this parameter doesn't change too much, the half-life of insulin, but insulin sensitivity changes by a lot, as far as I know. Did I answer your question? Good. Anything else? Um, uh, I just want to know, Ken, uh, why, why, so, so you did the uh, linear, I mean, uh, you didn't put anything on the but um, why, why, like, when, when we, does it really, is it really linear when we eat, or shouldn't it be, like, uh, You're asking about the shape of M when we eat a meal? Yeah, I mean, if the agility is M, you have the end and then it's linear, okay, you know, also you draw the picture there. Yeah. So why, why is it, uh, Shouldn't we, shouldn't we write a little bit? Oh, your question is why shouldn't M go like more, look more like this? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a more realistic a description is M kind of goes in, reaches the maximum, and then goes down. I just drew this as a yeah. system. Did uh, I? No, but also in the equation, you assume that because if you have the GDT, here you have all the M, and then you give the GDT. So uh, the question is why is, is a linear function of M here? This you can think about as the glucose source that goes into the blood. But uh, if you eat a hamburger, the relation between that and M is, is complicated by the factors in your intestinal system, et cetera, your liver. So that's, that's I think, a big topic of research now. Ran Segal's lab, for example, right? You eat something, you measure glucose continuously with the glucose meter, and it's different for different people. The transformation between what you eat and what you get in the blood. But, but is it like fair or closed to the synthesis? Is it constant? Like how would you assume it fades slowly or something? Or yeah. It's fair to assume that it's like at, at one point it starts getting to the blood and then it's constant and, then, and it just drops? And you ask if this, if this pulse shape is realistic. Close. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a first approximation, I guess, to the glucose tolerance test, which in reality is like a, like a pulse like that, probably. But uh, this is just for the simulation purpose. Did I answer your question? 50 percent. Okay. All right. So we finished the review. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <coughs> we finished the review. We can now go to new stuff. Okay. So the question is, how does it work that people with insulin resistance, also people with different body, blood volumes, etc., have five millimolar glucose? And we already began to answer. They make more insulin. People with insulin resistance make more insulin. And how does that work? It's what's known in biology as compensation. And the way it works is that the body, there are the number of beta cells grows, and also their size. So they have more beta cells, and they secrete more insulin in a way that somehow precisely balances the reduction in insulin sensitivity. That's the way it works. So if you look at the, at the pancreas of people with obesity, you find bigger and more beta cells in the islands. Hyperplasia and hypertrophy number and size of cells goes. So we, there's another feedback loop here about cell number and size that we need to understand, and we will understand. I just want to uh, draw here for you an interesting clinical observation between the amount of insulin you have when you wake up in the morning and your insulin sensitivity. So this is the parameter as insulin sensitivity, is how, many, how much insulin you have in baseline. And different people fall on a hyperbola where insulin resistance is sensitivity times insulin is a constant, which is great because that means this keeps this number constant between different people. The, no, the way to do that is more and less beta cells. Right? And that hyperbolic relationship is known but not, not really explained. We'll explain it in this lecture. People with type 2 diabetes are in this area. So they're below this a perfect. Did I explain myself? Huh? 
You can measure S by, um, the best way is by this glucose clamp technique where you give it an, an infusion and you, for instance, you can um, put in, in a unit of insulin and measure the effect on glucose. And you can even shut down body's endogenous glucose production with drugs and measure this parameter. Did I explain? So, yeah, so this requires like a special experiments. But then using models like this, you can calibrate using simpler measurements and get S and Q for, for different people. So, okay. so we want to understand this compensation phenomenon. And the way it works, as I said, like better cell growth, and we talked about this hyperbolic relationship. So we need to go into the realm of circuits of cell number change, cell proliferation. Yeah, question. Yeah, this curve is I naught is when you wake up. Yeah, it's like baseline insulin. And the reason is that after you eat a meal, insulin goes up, down. So you want to do it after eight it hours of fasting. Same. Even huh? after I eat a meal, S stays the same? S, glucose insulin sensitivity? Yeah. Generally, yeah, we can think about it as a parameter that's constant over a day, I would say, probably. I guess it can also change quickly if you have an infection or something like that. And, all right, so I'm going to erase this part here. Don't forget to vote tomorrow. We can erase this, right? Saddens the heart. <laughs> So, uh, so we want uh, to see, we want to figure out the circuit for cell growth. Now, here, I want to tell you something. When you talk about things like glucose, life is very safe. If I give you some production and some removal, which is proportional to glucose, glucose is going to find its steady state. Glucose is not going to crash to zero or to infinity or anything. It's going to crash to get to a balance between production and removal. Always going to get to a balance between production and removal. That's the world of molecules where you are produced and removed. Cells are not like that. Cells are explosive. This will in a second. Cells, if you're not careful, will grow exponentially and fill up the universe, like on, on paper at least, within a short amount of time, a month or something, or will crash to zero unless you keep their division rate and the removal rate exactly the same. So cells live on a knife's edge. And now, eh, as I'm saying the word knife's edge, a million cells in our body, my body, divide and a million die. So my body is in, in yours too, constant turnover. So our body, so cells in our body have turnover times between days and months in most tissue, like intestinal cells, days, skin, blood cells, weeks, and some cells are kind of almost permanent, like neurons, but most of them turn over. We turn over 100, about 100 grams every day of mass. One cent calculated that, right? What's the right number? 70 grams? 120. Huh? 120. 120 grams every day. Yeah. One cent from Ron Milo's lab. So uh, we're a constant turnover. So just the fact that we don't exponentially explode or, or collapse is, is a miracle, actually. Because if, if those numbers are just off, right, uh, you have an exponential collapse or decay. So let's spell that out. So here's a beta cell. And it, it divides, it can divide, right? You give two, this is called cell division or proliferation. And its rate per cell, we'll call it P for proliferation. And then a cell can also die. This is the symbol for dying in systems medicine. <laughs> and here we have a D. So this is cell removal. It could be cell death, or it could be dedifferentiation, energy, exhaustion, all kind of. So that's the process we're talking about here. And if we want to uh, write an equation for cells, I'm going to write an equation for cells. So this is the rate of change of beta cells. Rate of change. So how many beta cells are made per minute? It's the number of beta cells times the prol proliferation rate. Right? Beta cells can only come from beta cells. And how many are removed per minute? 
is the number of beta cells turned into a probability to die. So we have B on both sides. Unlike here, we, we don't have glucose here and glucose here. We have only glucose in the removal. Here we have cells on the production and the removal because all cells come from cells. That's the problem. They are explosive stuff. Cells are exponentially growing stuff. So that means this is, I can take B out of the parenthesis, proliferation minus death, which we call mu growth rate which could be positive or negative, <laughs> times B. So <coughs> dBdt equals mu times B. And I want to plot that for you. This is time, and this is the number of cells, number of cells. And suppose I start with a nice size, B of times zero. What happens if mu is greater than zero, there's proliferation larger than death? I get an exponentially growing e to the mu t situation. And if proliferation, is greater than death. And if proliferation rate is smaller than death, you get a crash to zero. Of course, in the body, what th this is like, like what happens in cancer. And this is like what happens in degenerative disease. And so in order to keep our size right, and this always amazes me, okay, it's like incredible. So think about it. It's like a little miracle. We, don't, we take for granted, yeah, that we don't collapse. We think we have big problems, but imagine if we would collapse. To keep a constant size requires some kind of feedback because you can't rely on setting a parameter and in biology and having it stay the same because proliferation depends on your nutrition, blah, blah, blah. blah. So what kind of feedback is it that keeps proliferating? So this is essential for all tissues. And this, this is a principle I'm going to teach you for all tissues. And it, the, the secret of how our body keeps the right size is every tissue, every organ has its own feedback loop. It's not a global thing. I mean, there's some global control by IGF-1 growth hormone, but each tissue has its own little circuit, as we'll see. There's a reason for that. So how does that work? Huh? Why should we always turn over? So I, I think one, one answer is uh, wear and tear. So in the skin, uh, because of this, it needs to be replaced every few weeks. So if the stem cells here, and epidermis, so you get differentiated into a layer of dead cells. And also in the intestinal lining, in the lung, in all the duct cells of the biliary lungs, the, the intestinal system. And uh, what else did I miss? Yeah. So a lot of cells are just working and need to, oh, red blood cells have a half-life of about 100 days, something like that. So there's wear and tear like that. But there's a more fundamental reason, as I'll show you, is that this gives you a slow variable that can adjust to things like insulin sensitivity. So there's another dynamical reason. And this growth is going to be the slow variable that's going to help us compensate. So it both keep, what I'm going to tell you is a feedback loop that both keeps the organ size right and allows all these to happen, both in the same circuit. You get it for free. Right? So really essential and this is something that's going to appear in every proliferating tissue there's no way around it so how does this work how does this work so the way this works is how do we have this feedback is that hmm? yeah yeah so the way this feedback is achieved so, is that secret is that glucose controls beta cell proliferation and death. So that it's the circuit, the beta, the, it's a variable that beta cells are controlling that controls their proliferation. I'm going to highlight this. So this is an extra variable. An extra piece of the puzzle. And how does that work? I'm going to now draw it graphically, and then we'll discuss it mathematically. But graphically is enough to understand, and this is something that we're going to. So what I'm going to plot here is beta cell death rate D. And what I'm plotting here is glucose. But I want to tell you, these cell divisions in organs like pancreas and the body, as I said, are slow. These cells divide maybe once per month or something like that. 
So our variable would be glucose, but not glucose over a meal. It doesn't care about the meal. It's glucose average over months. That would be our variable. This is glucose average over months. So everything I'll tell you, and, and there's actually a blood test that measures glucose average over a month. It's called hemoglobin A1C, which is glucose sticks to red blood cells. And you can measure, uh, and because the red blood cells live for 100 days, as I told you, you measure the average glucose of our 100 days with this blood test. It's a great blood test for diabetes and stuff like that. So this is glucose average over a month. So how does beta cell death rate look like? Yeah. So it looks like this. When there's too low glucose, beta cells die. Why? Because, I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you how that happens. Why is because, you remember that beta cells, what they, their function is to reduce glucose. So when there's too, too low glucose, beta cells die. There's less insulin, therefore more glucose. It's the kind of, when there's higher than five millimolar, beta cells die less. And at five millimolar, there's a kind of a crash, very steep crash. And then there's this part here, which is very high glucose level. And again, let's say around 15, there's something called glucotoxicity, very important for type 2 diabetes, where actually beta cells die at high glucose again. We're going to ignore that for a second and come back to it later because it's going to be very important. Okay, but right now, I'm going to just talk about this part of the graph. This is like the normal range, 5 millimolar. So beta cell death depends on glucose very sharply. What about beta cell proliferation? Looks like this. Proliferation. So it rises with glucose. What? This part here? Like, uh, this part? Concentration of, of, like, the amount of beta cells, right? This is proliferation rate for beta cells, division rate. No, not this, the yeah. black one. The black one is the death rate, the probability per unit time that beta cells die. So they die? They die more at low glucose and less at high glucose. And then they, ah, and then they, and then they start dying again at very high glucose. It's called glucotoxicity. This delightful uh, sugar come from grapes, it kills them. <laughs> kills the beta cells that are controlling glucose. Isn't that crazy? So, uh, so we'll talk about that. So the important thing to watch is this crossing point. This crossing point is where proliferation equals death. So if you're at that point, you're in this magical point here. Proliferation equals death, and you can keep your, your same number of cells. Yeah? So I'm going to draw this. This is a magic glucose concentration. But what happens in our body if we have too low glucose over uh, weeks. What happened if we're here? If we're here, death greater than prolif. So what will happen to the number of beta cells? It will shrink like an accordion. What will happen to insulin? Go down. What will happen to glucose? Go up. Because insulin makes it go into the cell. So what will happen to my glucose? will move up if I'm too low. What happens if I'm above 5 millimolar for weeks? Like I eat a lot of <laughs> What happens then? My proliferation is higher than my death. So what happens to the number of beta cells? It'll expand. What happens to insulin? It'll go up. What will happen to glucose? Go down. So this is a nice negative feedback that makes this 5 millimolar point stable. If we go away from it, up, let's say, beta cells expand, glucose goes down. If I go down, beta cells shrink, glucose goes down. So that's another reason for turnover. You have this accordion, beta cells, that can compensate for a lot of things. So this is a stable, stable fixed point. And uh, I'm going to write down the equation here. So it's just going to be mu of g 
times b. So this is the growth rate. And the special thing about it is that it depends on glucose. Depends on glucose. And it's zero at a special glucose concentration of 5 millimolar. That's when proliferation equals death. So this mu, this mu <coughs> thing, function of glucose, is a zero. Proliferation is lower. Is, it, it looks like, looks like this. It's zero at G0. And everything is stable and nice. So this is this model now is the big model, beta cell insulin glucose model. And I'm going to write down, and people who wrote it down are top and Diane Feingood. Yeah. In 2000. Based on ex earlier experiments on islets, beta cell islets, where you find this optimal range, the highest difference is around 11 millimolar, five millimolar. and there's a crash here. And by the way, th the fact that this crash is very sharp is important because if your growth rate is a little bit off, they still cross near five millimolar. So it's important to have a steep crash for this robustness property. Now, if this because this line is so steep, mm -hmm. if, uh, if the growth rate for some reason varies, the effect on the crossing point is very tiny. How do you measure the number of cells? What's the question? How do you experimentally measure the number of cells? So how do you experimentally measure the number of beta cells? The, the best data is from uh, autopsies or yeah, you see more or less by looking. Yeah. Um, so the master equation the start has P and D. Um, I guess I'm wondering, I don't understand enough cell biology, don't know enough cell biology. Well, why is P a constant as the, as the cells divide? Shouldn't the cells be kind of aware of nutrient availability per population? Or Your question is, uh, this proliferation rate, shouldn't it depend on things like nutrient availability? Yeah, yeah uh, the answer is yes. Sure, it depends on a lot of things. That's why you say this proliferation rate can vary. Okay. And that's why it's nice to have a, a nice death curve that's stuck at 5 millimolar. Where does it know 5 millimolar? That has to do with the signaling pathways in the cell. And it, eventually, it's encoded inside um, affinities of proteins to glucose that set off the killing machinery. So you can hardwire the 5 millimolar. I'll talk about that. Yeah? Why would you assume that the proliferation curve looks like that? Why do I assume it looks like that as opposed to? Yeah, could have looked at anything. Else. I don't care. Even it could go down, up. I don't care for this as long as it's below here and above here, for what I say. And I'm just thinking that zero glucose cells probably don't grow. And then I, I'd actually love to know this curve better, experimentally. Yeah. So, so is it the same sensing? through the same pathway that controls the proliferation and uh, insulin secretion? Is it the same pathway that controls proliferation and insulin secretion? And the answer is yes. It's the same pathway, and that pathway in beta cells is glycolysis. It's just a simple pr uh, process ha happening in all cells where you take glucose, phosphorylate it, break it down into smaller pieces, generate ATP, the ATP is a signal for some calcium that, or s some, some pumps, on this, some ion pumps that pump in ions, and that sets off vesicles with insulin to go to the surface. So it's the same. And also, it's, that goes to AMPK and the cell division pathways. So it's the same pathway that controls secretion and proliferation. Why do you ask? You keep it for later. Okay, good. I think it's also crucial. There's a linkage between secreting and proliferating. We'll find out. It's very important, <coughs> actually. So that's, uh, that's nice. Okay, so did I explain this, this feedback on the slow time scale of weeks to month? Better cell grow. Yeah. You said that if the proliferation, proliferation curve moves a bit, then it doesn't change the, the stable point. But right. if the death curve moves a bit, it oh. does. What happens if the death curve moves? Yeah, for example, if it moves to the this yeah. way. 
then it's bad. Or if it moves this way, very bad. Or if it moves this way, uh, for instance, type, di type 1 diabetes, our own immune system is killing the beta cells. So this moves up, up, up until this fixed point vanishes and everything crashes to, to actually infin infinite glucose, no insulin. So, so the death curve needs to be that part of it. I mean, it doesn't matter how high it is here, this part of it needs to be. That's the, yeah. Can you measure separately the proliferation and the death rate, or that's the difference between Can one experimentally measure proliferation and death separately? And you can. There's markers, molecular colors that specifically tar mark when cells are dividing or when cells are dying. Yes. Yeah. Something is yes, this puzzling because yeah. this is a very slow control. Yeah. So this could explain why on, on the average of a week yeah. it keeps at five. Yeah. It doesn't explain like if you eat something or if you start like, running around, yeah. uh, how can it be yeah. sustained at five minutes? Because before this thing turns in, yeah. you will have to wait for a week. Good. So uh, what Misha is saying that th there's two time scales here. This expansion of beta cells is weeks. But then we also have this fast feedback loop that we talked about in the review, where on the time scale of hours, glucose makes more beta cells secrete more insulin. And this gives you a pretty good control. It's fine. Well, why, is it stay, why does it stay at five exactly? That's right. So this alone, if you change parameters, can't explain that. But you can, on the slow time scale, you can adjust. So, so what I want to say now is, what I want to say now is this, this, this question I, I posed. So, Read people with insulin resistance, they have S is 0 0.1. What happens now? So suppose for weeks now you have S equals 0 0.1. Then beta cells increase, and everything, including the dynamics, becomes exactly the same as S equals 1. That's very interesting. So I just want to uh, just uh, explain this. The steady state here, in order to get steady state, you remember how we get steady state? We need all of these to be 0. Steady state means all this. In particular, number of B cells equals zero. And the only way you can get that so far is if G equals G zero. Because that's the only way mu is zero. That's to say, only at five millimolar do be beta cells stop m growing, shrinking. Itself. And that means that our steady state is five millimolar. Doesn't matter anything that happens in these equations. Doesn't matter what S Q, gamma, f of g, nothing matters. Because in order to get steady state, this equation it requires the g equals 5 millimolar. And the other equations have to cope with it. So let's see how they cope with it. What happens is, as you see, insulin, if we have a, s is small, insulin is going to grow until s times i is exactly equal to what it was before. And b cells are going to expand. So we're going to calculate that just so you can see it. <coughs> But the, this, uh, this is the way that you get, um, you get the compensation. Yeah. Then they'll get, to, uh, yeah, they'll be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this transient period. Yeah. There's a tra transient period. Yeah. Of, uh, I mean, it's not that bad off of five, but if you, if you, if you start exercising, and, or if you take a drug, let's say, that gives you insulin resistance, you're going to have some problems, but they'll go away. Unless you get diabetes. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'm going to solve for the steady state now. So I'm going to solve those equations for steady state. So dg over dt equals 0. So how do you get that? m minus s i g. But we know the g is 5 millimolars. We know that. We know because of this. That, that means that I steady state has to be M over S T0. All right. So smaller S, the more I steady state is. Or another way to write this is S times I steady state equals this number, the basal liver production of glucose divided by 5 millimolar. And this, my friends, is this. Constant, so we calculated it based on fundamental parameters. This gives you the hyperbolic relationship. It's based on beta cells expanding and shrinking to compensate for insulin resistance. Um, if I'm going fast, uh, I apologize, and we'll uh, be able to 
review it in the videos and soon we'll die out about it. So let, let's talk about the insulin, how much insulin is at steady state. So we have Q, B, steady state, F of G, steady G0, minus, minus gamma I, steady state. So uh, B, steady state is gamma I, steady state, divided by Q, F of G0. And I'm going to plug in I, steady state. Ah, great. Gamma, M0, divided by I, S, G0, that's I, steady state, Q, F of G0. So what do we have here? Again, smaller s, the more B cells we have. That's the way it works. It's steady state. If I have insulin resistance, small s, more B cells, so there's more insulin. And all these are numbers, so, but everything adjusts so that glucose is 5 millimolar. No matter what your insulin resistance, what your Q, what your gamma, what your F of G, how nice. So at the same time, we solve the problem of gland size control. There's no correct size for beta cells. The correct size is dynamically determined by the parameters in the rest of the body, like insulin resistance. So the cells grow and stop at the right time. They don't expl explode or shrink to zero or give you cancer and go to infinity. No. So cell tissue size control. And second, they give you this dynamic compensation where everything now, all the all the steady states, and in fact, entire dynamics, I'm not going to solve that, but you uh, need to, you'll have it in your handouts. The entire dynamics after a pulse is exactly the same, no matter, it doesn't matter what S is, as long as, as B cells are in steady state. So I'm going to, just to make the point even more clear, I'm going to draw this graph on a long time scale. So suppose now, this is now, time in weeks, and suppose our insulin sensitivity drops. Let's say it drops by a factor of two, a mild drop in insulin sensitivity. What happens to um, glucose? This is a kind of related to what Misha was asking. What happens to glucose? Sorry. It starts at five millimolar, and right at the drop, within days, or glucose is going to rise. You can't, this uh, feedback loop can't compensate for in days, it takes weeks. It's gonna but then, beta cells are going to rise. And over weeks, they rise, 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 and reach a new steady state. And because they rise, insulin also rises. And because insulin rises, glucose goes down. And glucose goes down exactly to the same steady state. But at the end of the day, beta cells are times two. Insulin is times two. Glucose is constant because S has gone down. So insulin resistance, we have higher insulin, more beta cells, glucose is fine. There's a, there's a transient period here, this transient period where things are not fine. You see glucose is different. So if I, in fact, eat a meal here and eat a meal a long time after this change, the results will look indistinguishable. The body knows how to compensate for glucose except higher insulin. But in the middle, everything will be kind of distorted. You'll get kind of a distorted insulin test, a, a glucose test in the transient period. Yeah? Uh, what, what if the middle cell has, has a memory of months? Why do, they, why do they care about time scale of months? So what carries time scale of months? The, the answer is, it's the fact that the <coughs> proliferation rate is really slow. They divide above, let's say, once per month. So that means the rate of change of the number of beta cells takes months, and that's the memory. Is there a... Is there something dangerous about having very high levels of insulin? I think there must be. Not, does anybody know about insulin toxicity? Is there any physiological conditions where the parameters like F change in time scales under months? Parameters like F of G? Like S, oh, so how quickly insulin resistance changes? In yeah, I think, for instance, the uh, infection would do that. Uh, I think pregnancy would probably take the third trimester, would be a month scale, and obesity probably also take months. And an another thing, very important, I remember last time I made a point that Q, this parameter, goes like one over blood volume because uh, this is production of insulin and it gets diluted out by our blood. Another cool thing here is that this 
feedback loop makes the number of beta cells scale with the size of the organism. The bigger you are, the blood grows, and this parameter Q also changes, and everything scales with this Q. That keeps out this organ proportional. It's another thing that cell tissues need to do. The body grows and you need to have everything proportional, so this feedback does that too. What a great feedback, right? I'm going to uh, ask you guys now to pair again and try to ask each other questions about this slow feedback loop. And at the same time, I'm going to distribute this experimental graphs showing glucose in normal and obese people that are healthy, not without diabetes. Insulin, showing that obese people have higher insulin. But when you scale insulin to baseline level, it's the same. So I'm going to distribute it. So every, like, there's not enough pages here, so you can take a look at it. But please turn to the person next to you and ask them questions about this thing, this slow feedback loop. Spread it over. But shall I go to select? Give the camera for you can uh, film it. control and the uh, homeostasis uh, feedback that's not dependent on any parameter. Uh, uh, this, 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 this special trick is called uh, integral feedback, by the way, used also in, uh, in engineering sometimes, where you integrate over an error, g minus g0, and, um, and this, this, these equations have special properties called dynamical compensation. And that was worked out by Omer Karim, who's actually here, he's back there. That's Omer Karim. <laughs> you can uh, pan over and, and photograph him. He's the guy who's very embarrassed now with the glasses here. Omer, say, go like this. <laughs> so uh, that mathematically, you can scale out S and Q and prove then the entire dynamics, only the steady state, is invariant to these parameters if you start at steady state. And that comes from the symmetry of the equations. The symmetry of the equations is that 
Um, beta cells come from beta cells, and beta cells secrete the hormone. That's all you need in order to have this kind of linearity here that gives you a, a, a property where your dynamics don't care about these variables, except for the transient period where the, where they, the variables do matter. So this is dynamic compensation. And um, you know, uh, it's not only in beta cells that this circuit exists, not only in beta cells that this circuit exists, this circuit, this circuit is actually a regulatory motif. A motif means a, a pattern that occurs again and again and again in a given biological system. So we know in transcription networks there's network motifs like feed forward loops and uh, certain kinds of uh, um, oscillator motifs, etc. that do specific functions. This thing happens again and again and again. So I'll give you, I'm going to write down here a few examples in our body, okay? So for instance, our, our stomach parietal cells make pH. And this is under control of a hormone called gastrin in our intestine that says, oh, there's not enough pH. It makes the cells secrete more and also makes those cells divide more. And pH, of course, stops it. So that's, you see, it's the same, same motif. Okay, that controls our stomach acid production and size of this. Okay. Another, thyroid cells in our thyroid gland, they secrete thyroxin, this important hormone for our metabolism. And that's under control of TSH. TSH in another gland, thyroxin shuts it down. TSH makes the secretion and also makes the thyroid glands proliferate. And you know sometimes you can get goiter, which is this large thyroid gland. So these cells can really proliferate, or thyroid cancers, etc. Same idea. Okay, so both controlling the level of thyroid hormone, so important for our metabolism. And people here, there should be about 5% people here with problems in the system because hypo, hyperthyroidism, very common. And then you don't have enough energy or too much energy. Usually it works fine and your, keeps your thyroid size and, and, and the secreted hormone. Or another example, uh, let's say, for example, um, stress hormone. So we have our adrenal cortex here above the kidney. It makes cortisol the major stress hormone. And cortisol shuts down an, another hormone called ACTH. It makes secretion and proliferation of the adrenal cortex. So if you don't have this hormone, like you no know, pituitary, adrenal cortex shrinks. Again, keeping uh, things balanced. And I can write another 10 like this. So this is a, a regulatory motif. And if you ask me, I would guess it happens in every tissue that needs to secrete something and control its size. Right. So very important to go to the abstract level because then you can transport your knowledge to other systems. All right. Now, if the system is so perfect and so nice and can compensate why do we have type 1 diabetes? Why does it fail? Why does it fail if it's so perfect, right? Why are these diseases? Why? <laughs> so let's try to understand, right, uh, based on this principle. And maybe predict where, when there should be additional diseases. And why some tissues do have disease. Something like all these interesting questions. The medicine that might have been and isn't. <laughs> okay, so that's going to be our goal now. To ask why type, why? type 2 diabetes. In this lecture and next lecture we'll ask, uh, answer about type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so how do, I so just need to refresh my memory here <laughs> for my notes. Created the drama and, oh first of all I forgot, we need to take a nice deep dive really. Let's take a nice deep dive. And uh, if this big feedback loop is so good, how does T type 2 diabetes arise? And the answer has to do with this glucotoxicity. So now I'm going to put my focus on the phenomenon that the beta cells that control blood glucose kill themselves when blood glucose is high. Yeah, this is called glucotoxicity. This thing. And it's, it's, it's studied because it's related to type 2 diabetes. So, so look what happens when you have this, uh, this uh, situation. What happens when you have this situation? 
the growth curve crosses the death curve another time. Did I explain myself? That's another time. So there's another fixed point. This is called a stable fixed point. This is stable. I told you things go back to 5 millimeter. What happens if you cross this fixed point here? What happens if you go above, let's say, 15 millimeter? It's not clear. This varies between people, person to person. Let's call it 15 millimeter. Suppose you go above 15 millimoles. What happens, I mean, average over weeks? Okay, we're talking about average over weeks. What happens to you? Better so. So what do you observe here about the proliferation and removal curve? You observe that, that death is greater than growth, than proliferation. See, the black line is above the blue. What does that mean to better cells? They, they atrophy, they die, they get exhausted, they, there's a lot of kind of things that... And then what happens to insulin? Goes down. What happens to glucose? Goes up. So this point here is a catastrophe. This thing here is... A, a, is, a, is a, this, from here on, the more glucose, the less beta cells, the more glucose, the less beta cells, the more glucose. This is a vicious cycle. Vicious. You that, that, who knows? <laughs> How do you write vicious? C I O. C I O. You write like that? Yes. David? <laughs> Can't see whatever. So, so. Vicious cycle where more glucose, less beta cells, more glucose. And that's, that's, uh, that's a problem. So that looks like some aspects of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And in late stage of type 2 diabetes, you need insulin injection. You don't have beta cells anymore. So, All right. so this glucotoxicity gives us a fragility to go above it, at high levels. And then you can ask, who needs this glucotoxicity? Why is it there? What for? So the why question, We'll get to it in a second. But first, I want to talk about the how, qu how question. It's different, right? How mechanistically do beta cells kill themselves with the glucose? Same questions you ask. It's also linked with the way they sense glucose. It's basically their glycolysis, the way they break glucose down, just like in every cell, creates collateral damage called reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species do damage to different things in the cell, DNA, protein, everything. Most cells have antioxidants that deal with them. But beta cells don't. They're like designed to die in moderate reactive oxygen species. They're among the cells that are most sensitive to reactive oxygen species. Some people think it's a historical or a mistake of evolution, something like that. But it looks like if it was, evolution would take care of it. It looks like they're designed to die, to have this glucotoxicity. So we can ask, does it have a biological function? Is there an evolutionary reason to put it there, right? And because type 2 diabetes is now, now it's very common in epidemic, but unlikely that it was unheard of in the past too, there must be a, a good selection pressure to keep this glucotoxicity. So what's the reason for glucotoxicity? Yeah? And here we need to think again about our situation with cells. This is another unavoidable consequence of biology of being a cell that divides. So we're going to ask, okay, so, so this uh, glucotoxicity creates an unstable fixed point which goes to this vicious cycle. So, oh, before I, before I explain what, 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 why it is, I just want to say that this picture explains a lot of risk factors for type 2 diabetes. So what are risk factors for type 2 diabetes? One is, of course, eating a lot of sugars, fats, and stuff like that. So pushing you in this direction. Another one is age. It's an age-related diseases. The incidence of type 2 diabetes grows exponentially with age. Yeah, 2 to 4 percent. Very old age as it goes down, because everyone who's going to get type 2 diabetes already got it. Mm. But 
Or dead. Yeah, but I'm talking about incidents among the living. <laughs> <laughs> Not even with death, so with death of course. Yeah. Okay. So what is going on with age? How can we explain why is it that tattoo that is more common with age? So what happens with age that's universal across all tissues? One of the many things that happen with age, we'll have a special lecture about aging, by the way, and aging related diseases later in the course. We can understand some principles. What happens with aging is the proliferation rate across the body drops. So t turnover is slower. Uh, every cell is older. <laughs> turnover is slower. And so what happens when proliferation rate drops? So what do you observe? You observe that the unstable fixed point comes closer. That means you don't need to go as high with your hamburgers. Right? That's the problem. And also, maybe your stable fixed point also creeps up a little bit because this curve isn't exactly sharp. And that indeed there's a creep up of Glucose in healthy people too, 5, 5.2, 5.4. So, so that's an age risk factor. Another risk factor is genetics. If you're twins and one has type 2 diabetes, there's a much higher chance than the other twin will have type 2 diabetes. There's a genetic factor. If you factor out all the environmental conditions, etc. And what happens with uh, genetics, one of the things that happens is apparently the glucotoxicity. curve moves with gene genetics. And the reason is that what we're talking about here is a, I'll explain that, I'll explain that after I explain the function of, of this glucotoxicity. It's going to turn out to be a trade-off between a disease and something else that's, that will determine, so it remind me about genetics. But of course, if, if you were born with a glucotoxicity curve here, you're more prone to type 2 diabetes with the same, with the same glucose eating regime. Did I explain myself? Questions? Yeah. Um, so it's true from, from, uh, from here that uh, like to the type 2 diabetes, unless the, the cells like, die, all of them, it's curable like, you know, uh, by like, keeping the, the glucose Absolutely. Yes, so the comment here is it looks like type 2 diabetes is curable and indeed it is. In fact, it should be a problem. If you, people change lifestyle in their nutrition and exercise, they control their glucose and there's no problem. It is. The problem is it's, it's hard for people to do that. I didn't understand. Why? After you cross that point, how, how come? After you cross this point, why does it help you to, to exercise? Oh, you did? Yeah, okay. Oh. Yeah. Yes, so, so. After you cross this point, and as long as you haven't lost all your beta cells, you still have them. So if I go back here, proliferation is higher than death. They grow back nice, big, nice. And when you go I back to the point. It's more stable when I go a little bit and the glucose goes up. Yeah, I yeah, mean it's like yeah. yeah, yeah, right. You have to make a decision to change your nutrition, start running or exercising, doing like. No, no. I mean, when you get to that point, I mean, you change your. I mean, you can only move with small patients, right? I assume. Then, then you move a little. No, you, you to can. Left, and then you can you, you your, up. The thing is, your nutrition, like your sleep, your sleep, then you eat, and you sleep, and you. So you have to average over oh. a lot of fluctuations like this. Oh. So this is like, uh, no. and then. Insulin resist uh, sensitivity, if it's changing, then uh, you have these transient periods all the time that you can have this problem. So you don't have to be always. No, you don't, no, you don't have to be always. It's like an average over a function. And it's a nonlinear function of glucose So it's an average of glucose to some power, you can say. So it it's, it's, it's highlights the extremes. Okay. All right. So what is it? So why? why what, so that's the how. The how is this reactive oxygen species. But why? So here, again, there's a fundamental reason that's going to apply to every dividing organ. And that's the fact that we're talking here not about 
engineering where you can build a thermostat and buy it from the company and the thermostat is going to give you what the temperature is to get the set point. Our thermostat is made of cells that are dividing. Cells that are dividing get mutations. If this mutation hits their sensing apparatus, that is a, they think it's, it's five millimolar glucose, but they think it's 20 because their receptor is mutated to something in the pathway. Those cells are going to be a problem because resist hyper-sensing mutants. So I'm going to explain like this. Because that proliferation. Let's imagine that we didn't have glucotoxicity. And these vessels are dividing all of them. Then there's a mutant. This mutant, so the actual, the actual uh, glucose concentration is 5 millimolar. This mutant thinks that it's 20. What do you mean thinks? It has a mutation in their sensors. Specifically, one very common mutation is in a protein called glucokinase. It takes glucose and phosphorylates it and keeps it in the cell. That's just a detail. If you're born with this mutation, congenital mutation, all the cells think there's too much glucose. They secrete a lot of insulin, and your insulin, instead of five, is one. And you generally, babies can die from that. And sometimes you need to remove the pancreas or do some excessive treatment for those rare congenital mutations. So. But since cells are dividing, there's no doubt that these mutations are going to occur. Just to give an order of magnitude, a gram of tissue has 10 to the 9 cells. The mutation rate is 10 to the minus 9 per division. So every time the tissue turns over, let's say once a month, you're going to get um, you're going to get uh, mut mutations. Right. So if you talk about the lifetime of a person, um, you can calculate that every year you get hit in this pathway. Ten times. Ten times, let's say. Yeah. Multiple times. And then what happens to those cells? They think, oh, there's 20, mil mil uh, 20 millimolar glucose. We need to expand and make more insulin to get that glucose away. That's what we're built to do. They don't know that they're mutant, right? They just think there's going to be more. So they start expanding. Now, they start expanding. That's very bad because they secrete so much insulin, thinking it's 20. They want to push it back to 5. But since they se they're sensing four times more insulin, they're going to push it back to 1.25 if they win. Once they take over, they're going to push it back. They want 5, but it's actually less because they, they think there's too much glucose. They have a perception problem. Did I explain myself? These mutants are going to happen. They're going to expand. So they're going to expand and, and eventually take over the islet, make a lot of insulin. Glucose goes down, 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 and it's lethal. So this is not just a small problem. This is a major problem. You build your beautiful control circuit to keep tissue size control, to keep glucose at 5 millimolar. But you build it out of cells. And those cells eventually will have a wrong sensor. And their set point will be different. And because of the circuit, they're going to have a growth advantage. They're going to have a growth advantage. They're going to take their entire set point to the wrong direction <laughs> and kill you. So that's another unavoidable fundamental feature of cell circuitry. And therefore, we need to deal with these mutants. We need to deal with these mutants. So how do we deal with these mutants? Glucotoxicity gives these strong hyper sensing, hyper means str too strong, hyper sensing mutants a disadvantage. Because now, because of this, their death is higher than their, their proliferation, they kill themselves. So this is like a fail cell device. They say, oh, too much. If we're sensing too much glucose, kill ourselves. That way you can get rid of these most dangerous mutants. 
the ones that think the glucose is so high, they're going to expand very quickly. They're going to secrete so much insulin. They're going to push, by the way, if they secrete a lot of insulin and start pushing glucose down below five, this is from five and four, all the other cells say, oh, we got to die. There's, there's too little insulin. So all the other cells are dying. And they're expanding. <laughs> and it's like, it's like not good. So you have to deal with them. So glucotoxicity is a way to deal with them. And in general, what you want is your signal, by Anisha, your signal, Anisha has an exam now, he told me. You want your, uh, sorry, you want your signal, your signal, whatever it is, I wrote down a lot of circuits, to make cells, and to be toxic to the cells at both high and low levels, you can say. Something like that. That's the biphasic control principle. And in physiology, there's a lot of cases of this biphasic control, like neural excitotoxicity, neurons where they fire too much, they kill themselves. Or immune cells, when they attack too much, they kill themselves, etc. Or energy. So there's a lot of these mysterious biphasic. Biphasic means U-shaped response curves that we think have to do. And I just want to say that the person who discovered this is, again, Omar Karim, sitting right here in 2017, Lecture 16 Biology. All right. So, them. Yeah, so, so before I, I, I sing something, your question is, so this is our unstable fixed point. What about all these mutants? So mild mutants. What, I'm, what I mean is it's 5 millimolar, but they don't think it's 20, they think it's 10. What about them? They're going to grow and cause a problem, right? So this biphasic mechanism is good for strong missensing mutants, but it still leaves a range of uh, hole in the protective system for mild missensing mutants. Is that right? So that's next lecture. That's going to be the secret of type 1 diabetes. Right? And that's, I mean, supposedly that should happen to us, right? And this should happen to everyone again. So I again, should take over. these mild mutants should take over. So they require an additional protective mechanism. That's next lecture. So this is the this is the build up for next lecture, right? What about those mild mutants? What else are you asking? What else? So yeah. So what happens if there's a mutation in glucotoxicity? What happens if there's a mutation in glucotoxicity? Yeah, you said that it's, that's evolution has yeah. all of these parts. So yeah, 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 let's talk about that. Right, what about, so it looks like if there's a mutation, if there's no glucotoxicity, so somehow, let's say, uh, let's say the beta cells have more reactive oxygen, like more ways to depend. So what happens there? So let's talk about this trade-off. What we're discussing here is a trade-off between two evils. Glucotoxicity, <coughs> protects against the evil of strong mutant takeover, but gives you the evil of type 2 diabetes. Now, you can push it, evolution can tune according to the risks of those two factors. So in, in populations that have gone through a lot of famine and not a lot of nutrition, are more likely to have type 2 diabetes, genetic factors. So, one way to explain that is their glucotoxicity curve pushes closer to 5 millimolar. What's the advantage? They protect against better, more against these mutants. But the disadvantage is if they move to a high-fat, high-protein diet, they're more likely to have type 2 diabetes. So it's, a, it's like a historical trade-off between dynamic instability type 2 diabetes and mutant resistance. And, and I told you last time about a desert rodent, Samon the Midbar, that has its glucotoxicity curve basically like here. And if you give it normal mouse food, it has obesity, diabetes, um, and beta cell de death. Really. So it's an example of an evolutionary tuning. Did they explain it? 
So that's, that's very interesting, I think, to think about the, the, the By the way, it's not, you can't find the gene for glucotoxicity or the gene for diabetes. It's many genes. So it's one of these multigenic diseases. It's definitely heritable. It's probably the sum of a lot of things. Yeah. How many generations does it take to adjust the population's So how many generations does it take to adjust something like this in a human being, yeah? So um, recent studies um, on adaptations in human genetics, like for instance, lactose intolerance, so you have populations that have milk and don't have milk and stuff like that, show that, I guess the time scale is, correct me if I'm wrong, is a thousand years? Does anybody know? No? It's like historical time scales. You can see shifts in gene frequencies. The, the reason is because of mating, of course. You, you, have, uh, you don't need to invent new mutations. You have polymorphisms. Polymorphisms means that in this population, we carry, for each of these genes, uh, each one of us has different variants of it. And the reason why those variants are supported in the population is trade-offs like that. Historically, it made sense to have a variation in the population so that by mating, you can quickly select individuals that are better for one set of conditions, better for other set of conditions by mating. So you can get, let's say, if you have a thousand genes that affect glucose toxicity, at your generation, you purify out one out and get another one, you can push this within generations. Yeah, the lactose intolerance is like a single locus, so it's easier to study. Yeah, more questions. This is great. Yeah. Do we have cells that would be like, instead of a mutation of the thing that you have more glucose, has less? Because we can use that to solve, you know, to the diabetes. Okay, the question is, do we have cells missing that missends glucose to the other direction? There's five millimolar that thinks there's one millimolar or something. And you say maybe we can use those. Yeah, to so just before we <coughs> use them, we say that if it's one millimolar, they're not a problem because they die. They kill themselves anyway. They're not a problem. They're not going to expand. It's the one that thinks it's too much that are prone to expand because they think it's too much. And uh, by the way, that's also a problem in the thyroid, a problem in the adrenal cortex, a problem in all those, the stomach. It's a general problem in all tissues. So, uh, again, what we're trying to do in this course is identify fundamental principles that are built in to the facts of life of biology, of physiology, and from them understand regulatory circuits and their fragilities. Yeah, so that's like, so type one, the diabetes is a good model system to start in. We continue with this to other kinds of diseases and afterwards. Um, and how to combat Diseases is also very interesting how this understanding gives you a ways to think about that, but I'm not going to expand. What else? Yeah. Uh, it's more common to how we can get this phenomenon from the peripheral tissues. And like eating more, you have to another hormone left in, which uh, will increase insulin resistance, meaning more glucose in the blood. Uh, cells that got, uh, beta cells will sense more glucose and then the whole population will be directed like above the catastrophe point which is like diabetes. So the comment is that there's additional hormones in our intestinal system like leptin and there's also in cretins and things like that that and as the food goes down and in the fat cells etc for instance there's one word food goes down and they tell the beta cells hey there's food coming and they become sensitized to make insulin much more than without, or leptin, which Resistance. like insulin. So these hormones can also play a role in diabetes right, and push you over the, the cliff. Did I send your comment? Yeah. yeah. Leptin has to do with obesity. But a, a lot of those hormones, a lot of these circuits, I, I want to tell you, still not understood, especially not on this level. Some of them not quite chemically, but on the mathematical level, there's like an opportunity to write down the version 1.0 dynamical system of the human body. Still waiting. There's just a few systems where we understand enough to do, to do it right now. More questions? Yeah. Is there a theory of how do you get such curves of proliferation and death, the death curve? How does this curve, where it comes from? <coughs> I don't know about a theory, but it's, the biology is, as I said, reactive oxygen species. So I would look for glycolysis rate and the damage of reactive oxygen species on cell viability to understand it. It's a nonlinear. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. How you get this sharp drop? Yeah, that's uh, an explanation for the sharp growth curve in this 
molecular systems biology paper by Omer in 2016, where you can uh, understand that glycolysis changes the ATP to AMP ratio. That goes to an enzyme called AMPK, and that sets off death cascades. And you can get, from the known cooperativity, a hill coefficient that is a steepness of 10 or 8 or something. So there's um, at least a kind of skeleton understanding of how you get this. Where the 5 millimolar comes from? It comes from the glucokinase uh, halfway point for phosphorylating glucose, which is 8 millimolar and some other numbers. And you can get this 5 millimolar. It's hardwired into the protein. So it's not something that varies from some stuff. Did I explain myself? Wow. Uh, these questions are so good. And they convinced me that you, you guys understood this lecture in a very deep way. It was very satisfying. Um, <laughs> I'm a hypersensing mutant baby. Watch me grow. I'm a hypersensing mutant baby. Watch me grow. When I take over, your glucose will be so low. Wait a minute, baby. I'm sensing glucose that's way too high. Wait a minute, mama. Glucose way too high. Because of glucotoxicity, I'm gonna hang my head and die. <laughs> All right, see you next week.